Hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast series where we explore ways to support and empower youth in leading healthier lives. I'm Max McDonald, and I'll be your host for this journey into topics that matter to today's youth. In each episode, we'll dive into discussions about physical health, mental well being, professional development, and more. Our goal is to provide valuable insights, tips, and inspiration to help you live your best life. Through interviews with experts and practical advice, we aim to equip you with the tools needed to make positive choices and create a healthier future. So whether you're looking to become healthier, manage stress, or navigate your path to professional success, join us as we embark on this empowering journey together. Get ready to live well and thrive one episode at a time. Welcome to the Living Well Podcast, empowering youth to live healthier lives. I'm Max McDonald, and on today's episode, we peel back the layers of social media deception and explore its profound impact on the well-being of today's youth with our guest, Dr. Michelle Ponty. Dr. Ponty is a pediatrician in London, Ontario. She works at the Child and Parent Resource Institute, CPRI, a children's mental developmental health facility. Her practice focuses on children with complex behavioral, developmental, and learning issues. This includes pediatric consultation about child development, dual diagnosis, and neurodevelopmental disorders. She works with an interdisciplinary team model and provides medical care to children in outpatient and inpatient services. Dr. Ponty is the chair of the Digital Health Task Force for the Canadian Pediatric Society. She worked with this task force on the updated recommendations on screen time in young children up to age five and examined the health effects of digital media use in school-aged children and adolescents. Beyond the idealized portrayals of success lies a world of comparison and self-doubt. Let's uncover the challenges of balancing reality with the allure of social media and discuss strategies for maintaining mental health in a digitally connected society. Welcome, Dr. Ponty, and thank you for being with us here today. Just before we start, I, uh, I'm just curious, what were the findings on your recommendations for screen time on children aged up to five years old? So the um, main findings, and this this persists over time, is that children zero to two years cannot learn from a screen. Mm. They don't have the developmental capacity um, yet to, to learn and there's no added benefits from introducing screens early. So I think that is a big point. And we also saw that over the pandemic in the sense that we all sort of were shut down and, and we were relying on our screens, right, to, to, to work and to educate our kids and to socialize. So we, we also have some data coming out of that. And, you know, just hot off the press as well is um, France is actually um, putting into uh, policy that no screen time under the age of three years is uh, beneficial. That's what they are recommending as a country. So, I mean, I think it's it's important to recall that, you know, just because we have this technology available to us and lots of marketing to young children doesn't mean that it's it's. Uh, healthy or developmentally necessary. So I think that's a key finding. And then limiting screen time for the two to five year range is always best. And we have this 4M model that I'm gonna explore further into the conversation um, about minimizing screen time for the youngest of our population. Definitely. So if we're to make a comparison to some previous topics we've talked about on this podcast so far, when it comes to exercise, it seems like the goal is to get as much as you can as, as much as you can to a certain extent. And with this seems to be the opposite, as little as you can, but at least for under the age of five. So let's move up to a slightly higher age bracket, just in general. Uh, how do you think that constant exposure to idealized images on social media contribute to feelings of inadequacy or and or isolation among young individuals? So I think that the one of the biggest things that social media contributes to is, is that comparison trap. And I think you mentioned that in the introduction. And, you know, if you ever find yourself in the comparison trap, you know, it's not it's not a nice place to be. And and, you know, young people are particularly at risk and even adults, you know, we're at risk of falling into this trap and we can become jealous and bitter. and We can feel uh, down on ourselves. Right. Be, by constantly comparing to those images and videos online of it's always the perfect happy people living perfect happy lives online, right? Mm -hmm. And so as adults, you know, you and I, we know that that's, you know, completely manufactured. We can sort of, we can understand that. Even, even as an adult, though, it's hard to shut out those perfect images and, and not let it affect us in some way. 
But social media, you know, it helps us to create these sort of fake and, and filtered world. And young people, young developing brains are not emotionally equipped to understand how, what they see online. And they take everything they see and read online as truth and fact. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard, it's exhausting to keep up with technology and trends and constantly try to figure out what's real or what's some kind of skewed version of reality, what's AI generated. So, so you know, it's, it's a tough place to be. Yeah. And like experience plays a big part as well. Like, you know, older people, people who have been around for a longer time, maybe even use the internet for a longer time, know from their own experience what things are real and what things are not. So that would play a big part as well. The younger you are having less experience, like, you know, there are some things where we're on equal playing fields. Like I don't know how to tell an AI image apart from a regular image. And I've been on the internet for as long as probably as half my life. So there are some things where we're on even footing, but it just goes to show that all of these things on social media need to be taken, with, I think, with a grain of salt for sure. How do you think that an individual, just a regular person, can get through that uh, that comparison trap and foster a healthy self-image in themselves? So um, there's some really good Canadian research being done that actually helps answer that very question, Max. And one group in particular out of Ottawa and led by a psychologist named Dr. Gary Goldfield they recently found that by simply reducing the amount of time spent on social media to one hour a day significantly improves body image. And, you know, this, this sounds like common sense. Mm -hmm. And, but now, and it is, it is common sense, but we actually now have some good evidence to show what I see sort of clinically in pediatric practice and really further to the point of, you know, improving body image by reducing social media use. We also know that individuals with a more positive body image have lower risk of disordered eating. And pediatricians across Canada saw this rise in eating disorders uh, uh, throughout the pandemic, which actually suggests a correlation between increased time spent on devices leads to poor self-image and lower life satisfaction and and the increase in disordered eating and, and actually all sorts of other mental health concerns um, including depressed mood and anxiety mm -hmm. so really the bottom line is less time spent on social media lowers your risk of a poor body image and low lower self-esteem and, and disordered eating in young people so I, I really want to emphasize that, but there is actually a caveat to this, right? Socially anxious young people can actually also find benefits from very specific, purposeful social media use and support groups online. And we can we we can explore some of those benefits and how to manage that in a bit. For sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you on just a more general, on most just more general point. Uh, what about someone who they really do want to reduce their social media, but they're finding it challenging because they're afraid of, you know, missing some some information or some news or they're or they want to hear an update from one of their friends? What about that? Like you're saying, how can I balance this out? And I really want to reduce my social media use, but I'm finding I'm, I'm almost too anxious to um, not persist in scrolling through right the feeds. Right. That FOMO that you mentioned. So, um, I mean, we can dive right into that right now. So in clinical practice, I'm, I'm actually counseling about healthy daily routines all the time. And you touched on exercise earlier. Mm -hmm. So I like to talk to parents and young people about a typical 24 hour day. Right. And I like to think of the 24 hour clock like a giant pie graph. So, Max, I want you to envision this large pie graph, okay? okay, and cut it into five pieces. Okay. Now, these pieces are not equal in size. There's a very large slice of our imagined pie, and that's the amount of time during our 24-hour day that kids and young people need to be asleep. They need yes. to be sleeping. So that's the largest part of the pie. OK. Yeah. Yep. And based on different ages that, you know, kids need anywhere from nine to 12 hours of sleep a night. OK, so it's almost half the pie. Yeah. Next, you know, kids and young people, you know, our full time job for kids is to go to school. Right. Mm -hmm. And that takes up, up about six to eight hours a day. And then you already mentioned exercise. So if we follow Canada's 24 hour movement guidelines, 
Kids and teens need at least one hour of vigorous exercise and one to two hours of moderate physical activity to keep our bodies fit. And then you add in another one to two hours for meals and socializing with family or friends. That actually only leaves a few hours for your other recreation, whether that be social media or a hobby or, or homework or other kind of online activities. And so when you break it up into that way, so I like to think of the S's to remind myself. So sleep is number one, mm -hmm. school, and then the activity is sports, and then socializing with family or friends. It actually sort of does transcend into this very focused time spent on screens. Mm -hmm. So that's how I like to counsel. And, and I think it's very uh, helpful to uh, balance our, our day like that. Mm -hmm. I, I I agree as well, and I we just to, I know you weren't here for this conversation, but previously I also talked with my one of my previous guests on uh, our dietitian James, who was on here a couple of weeks ago. Um, we talked about meal time and what meal time a good meal time looks like. He did mention that meal time he thinks research shows it should be free of screens, and it is free of talk about the rest of the day any chores or it's just a it's just a uh, free time for socializing and positive interactions without any screens. That's what he advocated for. So if you're keeping track of that, the listeners at home, if you're keeping track of that, that's one more spot to not use social media ad as well. So this free time, it's, th this free time, is there an optimal way to use this free time? Um, I'm assuming yeah, that absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I think the physical activity, um, we can't emphasize that enough. And I actually think in, you know, in, in clinical practice, um, I'm talking about sleep all the time. I think screens are interfering with kids sleep so much. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you're sort of optimizing time to think about a really set firm bedtime routine so that you can help your body sort of slow down and, you know, the screens, if, if we ask parents to, to help shut the screen off at least an hour before bedtime mm -hmm. because of the melatonin suppressing effects of the, the screen light. So that's a huge priority. So um, screen free uh, right before bed, um, at least an hour, screen free at meal times. And you know what? You're less likely to overeat too if you don't have a screen in front of you. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. A very helpful piece of information. It's it's a good tip. And I like to have sort of screen v screen free zones in a home, right? So, you know, you you can say, yeah, you've already mentioned the dinner table, sort of the dining area, wherever you eat around the kitchen. Um, bedrooms, keep tech out of the bedrooms is another yeah. screen free zone. Um, and I think, but, but then if you are going to use a screen, if you're going to be on a screen, you know, use it to your advantage, you know, there has to be a purpose to it. So is it educational? Is it entertaining, you know, at a developmentally appropriate, you know, stage right. content? Um, is it are you socializing? You know, a lot of kids socialize and they say, well, don't don't take away my screen, because that's the only way I, I can, you know, talk mm -hmm. to my friends. And then active uses, like get that screen and use those apps to get out geocaching or, you know, explore nature or, you know, fitness apps, right? Yep. So use it to your advantage. Definitely. And, uh, you know, this this is also, and I think was echoed before as well, screens out of the bedroom. That's that's a very important thing as well. Also mentioned for sleep mostly and for healthy habits as well. Something else I wanted to ask, this, all this information, we've been talking in the frame of reference for young people, like people who are below the age of 18. What about adults? Does this apply to adults too? Oh, Absolutely. In fact, so I was mentioning earlier about the four M principles of counseling on healthy screen use. One of the M's, Max, stands for model. Mm -hmm. So that means adults modeling healthy screen use in daily life. And so, you know, again, modeling, putting down your phone when you're eating, like don't even have it near you. And I think adults, we can all do better with modeling, right? Yeah. Definitely for teenagers and young adults, you know, no texting while driving mm -hmm. or even on even biking, even walking or, you know, see so many people with their heads in their phones while they're outdoors. It's so dangerous, right? For safety. Yeah, exactly. 
So definitely for adults, these these principles hold true, mm -hmm. and we can all do a good job as a society to model healthy screen use. Definitely. There's absolutely some themes emerging among this entire podcast. Modeling is a thing we've heard lots of, and I love hearing more of it. It is important. People around you pay attention, especially young people pay attention to what you're doing. They look to see what you're doing in, at all instances to learn from you. Been kind of a, this is a great conversation so far. This is going quite well. Yeah, I'm um, enjoying this. What role does social media play in shaping unrealistic perceptions of success and happiness? And how can individuals break free from these illusions? So social media is content that is created by us, right, as individuals for our peers to consume. And it's so easily filtered, it's easily edited, and it's easily shared and reshared and reshared. And I think that's that's the the message, right? It portrays whatever message we want, which of course is often this sort of best version of ourselves. And there's very, very few regulations or age restrictions in place. And even if there are, there's such easy workarounds, like take Snapchat, right? It was developed and geared to young people specifically to share images that would just disappear once viewed. But of course, kids all know how to take a screenshot and, you know, boom, or I should say snap, right? It's mm -hmm. instantly available to be reposted, shared, edited, mm -hmm. and it's now a permanent record. So, so I think that's the trick. This kid, we have to actually teach kids about the safety and privacy of the online world and young people are consuming vast amounts of peer created content that is so far from real life yes. right they're they're seeking validation they're constantly checking for likes and replies and reassurance and it's it, as you mentioned earlier it creates a sense of like the fomo the fear of missing out and feeling inadequate and and ultimately at the end of the day it creates this deep deep sense of loneliness and isolation which is so ironic because mm. it's supposed to be social yes. <laughs> social media but it's actually you know creating loneliness and there's actually another Canadian researcher Dr. Pat Conrad who actually examines the effects of screen use on adolescents and and her research finds that the type of screen use and the digital content matters more than the device itself or the time spent so Exa exa exactly as we were touching on earlier, educational TV programs, for example, can foster feelings of well-being and pro-social attitudes versus some of the negative harmful content that kids, kids are exposed to. And I think it's really important to teach our kids how to recognize these feelings that they're having. You know, why are you feeling so moody and down and depressed and irritable? after mm -hmm. you've just been on your social media apps mm. and, you know, or other online activities. Like, why are you feeling like that? And help them label their emotions. And then they can start to understand a little bit. Oh, okay, wait a minute. That's all fake. It's not real. So, you know, to help manage the emotions around that. And then once they recognize that, that empowers a child to choose better content, inspiring content, and recognize, you know, when something isn't just quite right. Right, because that all these platforms aren't going to, they don't do content moderation. They do the bare minimum to keep themselves from being impl impl implicated in crimes, but they are not going to steer yeah. you towards uh, good content that is helpful for you. They're going to keep giving you whatever you're clicking on, right? They're yeah. not there to help yeah. you. People around you are there to help you. Your friends, your family, they're there to help you work through some things that you've been watching on social mm -hmm. media. Absolutely. Again, talking about what adults can do, right? To be present in the general vicinity of when your kids are online. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always like to share an anecdote from my own, um, uh, raising my own children with, with technology. Um, one of my daughters was a late bloomer learning to read. And when she discovered... Um, uh, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series like she actually took off in her reading so we were really excited about that mm. and one day you know the house was quiet and I thought she was off reading but in fact she was um, online uh, searching to where to buy a Harry Potter wand but the autocorrect searched Harry spelled H-A-I-R-Y mm. wand and so she then all of a sudden got all these 
horrible graphic images as you can just sort of use your vivid imagination yeah, yes. what she might have seen so and that's because I wasn't there present I wasn't kind of hovering over kind of just glancing on the screen seeing what she, and you know she came running out with this horrified look um so oh, no. you know that's again awful. it's it's my reminder so I always say Harry Potter is my reminder of you know being present when your kids are online and yeah. being in the general vicinity right yeah, it is completely unsupervised. There's no, there's no one on the other side of Google watching to make sure your child's not looking up anything by accident or on purpose. So I think these are very important things to keep in mind that this is just, it's a completely unsupervised play area. You're letting them go by themselves <laughs> to the park, which is, you know, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's just do at your own risk, I guess. Parents, I, 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 well, I want to take that back. That sounds a little too vapid. Too, that sounds a little too, uh, flippant i should say um you know just be aware that this is an unsupervised area for your kids to play in and i think that's a really great analogy you know just sort of like would you send your kid to the park with you know a toxic substance and say go have fun and it might be a bit risky yeah. right you know we don't do that and i actually like the analogy of you know 16 year olds getting their driver's license you know you have to go to classes you have to pass a test you know, you have to have graduated driving with a supervised adult with you. There's seatbelts and and there's, you know, the, the airbags all built in to keep our kids safe. Mm. Um, but yet these devices, we just kind of hand our kids and say, go have fun and good luck without yeah. any rules. Yeah, go play at the park with the with the four 16 year old boys that are that don't have their parents anywhere nearby. Something like that. Got it. Yeah. Um, so I think I want to ask a question about reducing use how to reduce mm -hmm. use of screens especially what people are we've heard a lot of so far is doom scrolling that i i, I, I don't even know what that word means but i'm assuming it's something bad uh involving social media specifically things with feeds twitter instagram facebook i don't know if snapchat is a feed but something along those lines how does someone how does a young person work towards reducing the amount of time they spend on these things if they already spend a lot of time and yeah, and it's such an important issue. And, you know, I get kids and young people and parents coming to me all the time asking for help. And, you know, we're trying to strike a balance, right? Because screens aren't all bad, right? They're yeah. not all good, but they're not neutral, right? They, they have an impact. And so how do we balance the good with the bad? How do we mitigate that risk? You know, how do we manage it and, and keep it safe and, and to our advantage? So, so I would encourage your listeners to seek out the resources at the Canadian Pediatric Society and Caring for Kids because we have this really nice 4M model for answering this very question. So, you know, there, as we were just discussing, there's only 24 hours in each day. Right. And, you know, it can be all consuming these screens and often hours and hours go by and we don't even realize it. And then our moods fluctuate, right? And then we miss out on what's going on around us and we, we can become irritable and lethargic and unmotivated. So I think the first, one of the main M's is make it meaningful. So just start by doing a little bit of a self-assessment and saying, you know, is, is, is this a serving a purpose for me and my life? Is it enhancing my life? And I think just by asking ourselves that very simple question, it, forces you to put it down if it's not enhancing your life or if you find yourself in the doom scrolling trap, mm -hmm. right? You ask the question, is this meaningful to my life? No, well then we have the control to just turn the phone over or turn it off, right? Exactly. And you know, ask things like, is it make my life better? Or is it entertainment, right? Is it good, healthy, you know, appropriate entertainment? Am I connecting with friends and family? Am I learning something new? You know, am I looking up a recipe? Does it make me feel good? Am I, or, or am I feeling moody and irritable? So, you know, as a pediatrician, I'm counseling parents to help their kids recognize this sort of change in their emotions and feelings. Mm. And, and I think, you know, the other thing we have to teach and prepare our kids is about the safety and privacy. So, you know, what it means about consent and what is harmful, what is considered, you know, a lot of kids will just send this stuff out and say, oh, we're just kidding, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. just kidding. Well, you can't, you can't do that. You have to teach them that that's not appropriate. That's considered bullying. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we talked, so we've talked about making it meaningful. So M, we've talked about the model. So that's mm -hmm. another M. Yep. Um, and, you know, another way to sort of, and the other M is sort of managing it. And one way to manage is what you're asking, how to balance it, is to create a little plan, a media plan for yourself. So you can create a plan for yourself as an individual, or if you're a parent listening, you can actually go on to the CPS uh, website and there's a link for how to make a family media plan. And there's a drop down menus, depending on a child's age and development of different ideas of how to manage the screen time in any given day or in any given household. So that's a good place to start, right? Give right. yourself a little plan and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to get on my socials between here and here. I'm going to shut it off at an hour before bed and I'm going to not do it. And you're not going to get on my phone at mealtimes. That's a really fairly Easy, easily place, you know, to start, right? Right. Yeah. So um, I, that's that's how that's how I I think the other M for parents is to monitor. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of touching on that with my Harry Potter anecdote, like you know, to be present, you know, when your kids are online, to co-view, and right. also to monitor for what we call problematic screen use. And that's when kids are displaying irritability or if it's interfering with other healthy life activities like sleep and exercise or school, right? If kids are starting right. to not do well at school. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that kids will do if they have a problem with screens is they insist that they need it, right? Even older right. kids, you know, teenagers, I, I need this. Mm -hmm. So, um, that would be the final M is to kind of monitor for that. Right. And you can do it yourself. If you're a young person listening, uh, you can monitor yourself for some of these behaviors. If I can speak from my own experience, I got rid of my Facebook. Oh man. I think like it was four, five or six years ago. Now I just, I, it was a long time coming. I, I, I noticed in myself, I was, my whole feed was becoming like news articles. This was like in, you know, 2016, 2017, it was all like news articles. And some of the news would make me upset for whatever reason it was bad news or something. And it was, or it was deliberately, you know, inflammatory speech it would make most people kind of frustrated and click on it and read it to get their clicks. Right. I noticed that I wasn't having a good time on social media, making me upset or anxious. So I made the decision to slow down my use. I like paused my account, which is an option. You have lots of options on these social media apps as well for like managing your own time with them. Uh, you can pause your accounts and stop using them for to take a break if you want. I decided to go all the way and delete my Facebook and my Snapchat um, a long time ago because same thing with Snapchat. The, they held this whole second page. It was full of these awful clickbait articles. So that was making me frustrated. So I got rid of it. Uh, and you can realize those if you can recognize those emotions in yourself, I think making the choice to stop using social media is a great thing. You don't miss anything. Nothing is missed. Mm -hmm. I still have Facebook Messenger to talk to my friends. That's still great. I still text my friends. I use my phone. I, I'm, you know, I have all the normal things everyone else has, but I take care to take care of myself. I don't use something that makes me upset. So, and I think if a lot of people are taking some of the events that Michelle is using here, or some of the, sorry, some of the advice that Michelle is is, is giving here, it would be to be aware of what's going on in your life uh, and parents to be aware of what's going on in your children's life and take the best steps you can uh, to limit that thing's use because you don't need it. It's nice to have, but you don't need it. So you know, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you were able to do that for yourself, Max. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, young families and young kids that just don't necessarily have the capacity to recognize that and to learn that. And so I, I think, you know, we, society at large, this is, you know, this is something that we, we it has to be a coordinated effort that, you know, we let this get way out of control. It's time to rein it in. It's it's not necessary. It shouldn't have to have been your responsibility to recognize your emotions and delete the app and to realize, wait a minute, yeah, this is what's causing my irritability. Mm. It, you know, it should have been upstream already. So it, it, yes, we're, this is a this is a public health issue. It's a and it's public not, health issue. I was one of the lucky ones who's able to realize uh, 
I was able to realize myself how to fix this. Not everyone's going to have that experience and that is totally fine. This is your own journey. If you can figure it out yourself, great, that's good. But I also fully support all the decisions we make to limit social media use, to, to do our best as a society to limit social media use because not everyone's going to get it by themselves and that's totally normal. So. Yeah, and more and more professionals are being trained in how to manage um, you know, problematic screen use. So if you're a family or a young person that's struggling, I would actually go seek professional help, whether that be, you know, your child's teacher, uh, your pediatrician, family physician, nurse practitioner, um, psychology, social worker, that like more and more professional groups are actually um, getting education on how to manage this. Mm -hmm. And other resources, we could do some resource talk at the end, uh, mm -hmm. if you wanted to list a couple of resources out, if you want to go through a couple right now, these are all great, we can all put them in our description as well. Sure. We so, them. yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, number one, of course, is the Canadian Pediatric Society. And they actually have a parent site called Caring for Kids. So that's the two sites. Um, a, a, a great website for uh, online safety is the Canadian Center for Child Protection. And you can actually sign up for free um, uh, emails. Um, it's called cybertips.ca. So mm -hmm. if there's if there's something, if there's sort of a, a bullying uh, event or a scam or something going on, uh, you can get a cyber tip uh, right in your inbox. Um, the kids help phone line is is amazing for 24 seven help for for kids struggling. Mm -hmm. um, so those are my my top uh, few and um, lots of other re resources, uh, again, through CPS. Another one for uh, people that are looking for um, like curriculum around digital literacy is through Media Smart, um, which is Canada's Center for Digital Literacy. Okay. So I would check check them out as well, especially for parents and young people who are looking to how to, how do I set all these privacy or you know uh, safety controls? How do I set that up on my phone? There's some really good tips uh, on there on Media Smart. Right. And um, yeah, and it's never too late to start. It never is. I I yeah, exactly. I want to leave people always feeling more hopeful that hey, you know what? It's never too late. We can we can manage this. It's, you know, it's just a device. You have control over it, right? Yeah, exactly. You have control over it. Yeah, those affirmations are good. You have control over this. This is your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the virtual escape provided by social media hinder individuals from addressing realities of their lives? I go back to our initial discussion that this is primarily comparison. It's a comparison trap. Right. So they, you you fall into this screen and you fall into this virtual world that's completely manufactured, fake. We don't know what's real. We don't know what's AI generated. We don't know what's, you know, behind that screen. Um, but yet our mind somehow tells us that, no, we need to believe this. And, and we start to doubt our own selves. And, you know, again, it's a trap. We, I think simply by turning it off, lifting your eyes away from the screen and getting out into nature, looking out your window, it sort of just clears your mind. So, mm -hmm. um, I, and I, I often advise people to do that anyways, even if you use a screen all day for work. Um, you know, we haven't really touched on the physical impacts of screen time, right? But mm. the, we're seeing lots and lots of visual problems with kids that myopia needing glasses earlier and earlier, because of, you know, see, looking at that screen instead of looking at that sort of far distance natural light outdoors. Mm, it's true. I never thought about yeah. the, the, the light difference of like an up close, you know, I'm like probably two feet away from my screen right now. Right. Yeah, yeah. and so your eyes adjust to that two foot distance, but you, you know, I suggest that, you know, every 15, 20 minutes, uh, take your eyes off your screen, and hopefully you're near a window, look out at a window for even just a minute or two to get that natural light, and to get that distance, so get your eye adjusted to the far distance, it's, it's a lot healthier for your vision. Mm -hmm. And that's without talking about sitting as well, how much sitting affects us. Uh, mm -hmm. Just so we won't get into it too much here because I don't want to get too off topic, but anybody who's listening and, is, and sits for a lot for their job, try to get up and move every hour just for even five minutes. It's good. 
stretch your hip flexors, work your core. Both those things are good for you. I used to work at, uh, uh, I used to work at a, a TELUS. As a, I was sitting at a desk all day. So I got really into trying to exercise as much as I could. Oh, I did like desk such, exercise. Yeah. Oh, and the standing so, desk. So that's the same desk was nice. We had a yeah. standing desk, but treadmill desks are where it's at. That's the future. Can't wait for that to be the case. <laughs> I can't wait for that. Yeah. So we've talked about how to escape uh, the realities, how people how people uh, can get away from this escape aspect, this uh, the the trap. What was it called again? The well, I call it the comparison trap. Yes, that's it. You yes. know, and um, it's it's yeah. So how do we? What what steps can we take to strike a balance between that online engagement and real world responsibilities? You know, I think to strike that balance, you have to take a cold hard look at if you really need to be using this screen right now in this moment, what purpose is it serving? So for us right now, we're actually using a screen to communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an awesome use of screens, right? Communication, work, you're, you know, you're doing work, you're, you're doing education, learning. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing bad is going to happen and leap out at the screen at us, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the screen itself, right? It's how we're using it. So I think from a pediatric lens, you know, the early age groups, we really try and limit it. And we talk about screen time limits, how much. And then as we get older, sort of school age and teenagers and adults, we actually talk about and think about it more conceptually as how, simply how are we using the screen? So is it educational? Is it social? Is it active, right? Are we learning something? Are we having fun? Is it, is it enhancing our life? So that's what I would ask any individual listening to say, ask yourself, is this screen enhancing my life right now? How, what purpose is it serving? And if it's, if it's not serving a good purpose, then just put it away. Absolutely. I agree, I agree wholeheartedly. And this has been a fantastic conversation. I just want to say, I got one last question for you. Is yes. there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we haven't touched on so far today? Um, I really want to emphasize that I am so impressed with parents. They are doing their best. They're very creative with you know, how they're managing screens without the rules and restrictions and policy that we actually need. Mm. Um, I think I would highlight that the uh, CPS put out a social media and youth call to action in November, 2023, so just. Um, and I, I think it's you know, important to highlight that um, we need policymakers, we need legislation, we need tech design and developers to really adhere to some some strict rules and restrictions and regulations around all this stuff before you know putting new tech and devices on the market and you know it's per particularly disturbing to me is when we get um, devices that get onto the market that um, support our tech. So for example, there's those, I'm sure you've seen it. There's those iPad holders that you can prop up on a baby's crib or a baby stroller that holds the iPad or holds a, a mobile device of some type. And you know, we know that kids aren't learning from that screen. It's just to sort of keep them calm and pacified. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, there's so much more enriching things that a child could be learning when they're out and about in the community. Yeah, so what, they might get fussy. But so did all of us, you know, just, you know, 10, 15 years ago, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like kids, kids are okay. You know, you can learn other strategies to help soothe them, self-soothe, self-regulation. And, exactly. and so I, I feel like a lot of the products that support tech for babies and infants is, is really problematic as well. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about like, uh, like, like, I guess like uh, living tech, I don't say living technology, so like wearable technology, like like AirPods or Apple watches. There's not just Apple watches, but any type of like Garmin that you might wear on your wrist, or like that you have on you 24 yeah. seven. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's great. I think, I think, you know, evolving technology, it's fantastic. I mean, we're such a brilliant creative species. I think it's fantastic. But again, as long as it's enhancing our life and it's not distracting you know constantly checking your your device uh while you're out socializing with friends um or you know i think if it's monitoring your 
your health or it's monitoring your fitness and it's boosting it's, you know, it's getting you out and getting you active. Hey, I think that's great. So I don't have any problem with technology itself. It's mm. again, the rules and restrictions around it and how we uh, are using it. Exactly. I love that, that it's just, is it enhancing your life? It's a very easy question to ask. And I think whenever I do our call to action, which, hey, let's do our call to action right now. I do think that people who listen to this, who are concerned about this in their life, and even if they're not concerned about it in their life, should take some time to reflect on that question. Is this technology benefiting me? It's a very simple question, but it's a very powerful one. Is this thing improving my life? And if not, what can I do to change that? So I think those are right things that our listeners can all do. And I think that they should all uh, keep their eyes and ears peeled for any sort of changes that they can help influence uh, for improving people's mental health and well-being with changes of applications. It's not the end of the world that they want to regulate Facebook or Twitter or, or, or Snapchat. Those are all probably positive things that are, that are relatively unregulated right now. So regulation could really help most people. And I'm just gonna do a quick summary of our, all of our main points. I, although honestly, I wanna just leave it with the, uh, is this technology helping you in some way? And I think, you know what? I think that's probably the biggest takeaway point from this. So I'll leave our key point with, just keep that in mind. Keep in mind, is this technology helping me in some way? Is there anything else you wanna add, Michelle, before we wrap things up? Oh, wow. I think we could talk for hours, Max, on this and, you know, give certain, you know, personal examples. And um, I, I, I'm just hopeful that, again, as, as a society, we can work together and, and make our future healthier. We can create a healthier digital world for our kiddos and our teens and young people and ourselves um, without all the fear and the hate and, and the um all that negative stuff that that kids have been exposed to mm -hmm. yes i agree those things don't, they don't need to be in kids lives they don't they need do to be in not. our lives either no yeah. no so it's been very nice talking to you michelle <laughs>